you're here tonight for tonight's presentation that Marilyn is going to be doing on native plant landscaping. Um, Marilyn's been um, passionate about the idea of, of bringing nature home and has been president of the, the Prairie Edge chapter of Wild Ones, healing the earth one yard at a time. And she's going to be talking about um, native plant landscaping with a special uh, focus tonight on what we need to do in the fall if we want to do native spring planting in the spring. And we're going to have her back in April to tell us what to do in the spring. So this will be a two-parter and we can, um, and this will give us all a chance to, to get started on this. So take it away, Marilyn. Thank you, Fran. First, I want to just make it clear that um, bringing nature home is something, a, a phrase I borrowed from Douglas Talmy, who wrote a book by that name. He's an environmentalist and an entomologist. So I'm with um, Wild Ones, the Prairie Edge chapter. We have, oh, 60, 70 chapters across the country and um, about 10 maybe in Minnesota. So there is one, probably the most convenient one to most of you is the one that um, meets in Ridgefield at the Wild Ones, at the Woodlake Nature Center, the Twin Cities chapter. So I am here to ask you all to rethink your lawns. I have to put, I have to change the view here or else I can't see my notes. Huh. Maybe that'll work. Um, most people think of their lawns as something to take care of. Non-native turf grass is one of the largest irrigated, irrigated crop in the country at 40 million acres. In the United States, we spend $60 billion annually to water, fertilize, and mow our lawns. And I'm sure every rover would agree it'd be better spent on a vacation. Maintaining our yards uh, is polluting our air, depleting our groundwater, and turning our sky blue waters green. Many people would be surprised to learn that they could do less work with huge benefits for the environment. Feel like there's a picture missing there. There we go. We could turn our yards into beautiful prairies, woodlands, and even rain gardens that can fill some of the functions of a wetland. 50 some years ago, Lori Otter, founding member of the natural landscaping movement said, if cities and suburbs were landscaped with meadows, prairies, thickets, or forests, then the water would sparkle, fish would be good to eat again, birds would sing and human spirits would soar. Now the stakes are even higher put in a native plant landscaping to support biodiversity, mitigate climate change, and make our communities more resilient in the face of challenges to come. In return, our yards take care of us by providing the ecosystem services needed for a healthy planet. So this is just a quick um, definition of what an ecosystem is. It's a biological community of interacting organisms and their physical environments. The ecosystem services shown in the graph on the right are the benefits people obtain from ecosystems. Native plants and the animals they support are all an integral part of the ecosystem. We all depend on the natural world around us to provide the clean air, nutritious food, clean water, and shelter we need to survive. When we damage our ecosystems, their ability to provide these services suffer as well. We need to protect our ecosystems, not just for the humans, but for all the animals and plants we share the planet with. So first of all, what is a native plant? A native plant species is one which has evolved and survived within a biome. 
without human assistance. That means that Minnesota native plants can survive our temperature extremes. They are also resilient in the face of drought or heavy rain events. Native plants also have more resistance to the pests and plant diseases found in Minnesota. Unfortunately, 99% of our prairie has been destroyed. 98% of our old growth forests have been logged and 50% of our wetlands have been drained. How can native plants improve soil health, control flooding, prevent erosion, purify water, replenish aquifers, and sequester carbon? It's because of the vast network of roots up to 15 feet. As the roots grow and die back naturally each year, they add air pockets and organic matter that soak up stormwater, runoff, preventing flooding and erosion. The decayed roots form channels that allow water to soak deep into the ground, replenishing groundwater. The living roots exude excess carbon that the plants remove from the atmosphere. These root exudates feed the soil microbes that aid in carbon sequestration. After planting the deep roots of native plants, we'll begin the process of turning hard dirt into spongy soil full of water, life, nutrients, and carbon, except maybe in a drought like this year. No supplemental watering is needed after the native plants are established. No chemical fertilizers are needed ever. The microbes contained in healthy soil supply the native plants with all the necessary nutrients and even the disease resistance. For these reasons and more, native plants are an essential part of planning for climate resiliency. Native plants are the only source of food for 90% of our herbivore insects. 90% of plant eating insects can only eat the plants they co-evolved with. A well-known example is the monarch caterpillar that can only eat milkweed. Without milkweed, we wouldn't, go, we wouldn't have the beautiful monarch butterfly. So why are insects important anyway? Insects are essential food for birds, reptiles, amphibians, fish, some mammals, and in some cultures, even an important source of protein for people. Insects are the little things that run the world, according to E.O. Wilson, a noted conservationist. You may have heard the term insect apocalypse. Scientists are learning that habitat destruction, herbicide use, and light pollution are decimating insect populations, even the ones that can theoretically fly away to a nicer habitat. 97% of terrestrial birds rely on insects to feed their chicks. Most chicks are not able to digest seeds. They need soft caterpillars full of essential protein. If you enjoy watching and listening to birds, you need to feed the whole family and that means growing native plants that are food for insects, that are food for the chicks. Returning our yards to a native plant community can slowly help the loss of species and protect biodiversity on our native insects, birds, frogs, and other creatures. But not all plants support the same number of insects. Some are superstars at feeding caterpillars. We call them keystone species. So I think rovers mostly know about uh, the unfortunate buckthorn and garlic mustard and creeping bellflower, et cetera, et cetera, of native plants. But um, what a lot of people don't know is unfortunately some, you know, they. They bought them with good intentions at their landscaping nursery, that beautiful lamer maple, the barberry, the burning bush. Turns out it's, it's all invasive. Maybe not yet to the Midwest, but I've been as close as Pennsylvania and just seen barberry with their terrible thorns everywhere in a, in a woodland. And it was just heartbreaking to see. So, just because it's not yet invasive here doesn't mean it's a good idea to keep it. So 
So I hope you're ready to replace your turf grass or at least some of it. You might be wondering where to begin. There are government resources to get you started, whether you want information or even financial assistance. Some watershed districts have grant information sessions in early spring. The Lons to Legroom program only offers a few hundred dollars, but the application only takes a few minutes to complete. People wonder if their city will allow native plantings. Eden Prairie not only provided uh, Tom and I with three grants, three years in a row, a grant each of three years, I should say, to, to install our rain gardens, they honored our efforts with the Spirit of Eden Prairie Award in 2016. And thank you to um, Rovers and Wild One member Lori Triss for nominating us. So where should you put your native plant garden? There are many options, including you can start with an area where turf grass won't go very, grow very well anyway, because it's too shady or dry. This garden is under a maple tree where the canopy is so dense it receives far less sun and even less water, making it a so-called difficult area to plant. But these natives seem pretty happy. You can support clean water with rain gardens, shoreline plantings, or boulevard gardens. You can plant pocket prairies, hedgerows, woodland, and understory gardens. You can plant to attract and support hummingbirds, seed, fruit, or nut-eating birds, or pollinators such as butterflies and bees. You can pick a spot in your yard that's visible from the window above your kitchen sink or wherever area you choose. There is a native plant that will thrive there. So I just wanted to give a few samples of gardens that I have around um, Tom, well, I should say Tom and I, Tom's here, um, have in our yard. Stacy is shaking her head at me. Is there something wrong, Stacy? It's just so gorgeous. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, you will often hear, so I was a traditional gardener first and um, I was very confused by the nomenclature. So full sun plants might have, instead of an S symbol by them, they might have a P symbol by them for prairie. So native plants that grow in full sun can be referred to as prairie plants. Native plants that grow in full shade are woodland plants. Native plants that dislike intense midday sun but grow well in morning and later afternoon sun are savanna plants. The north backside of this border garden has taller shrubs that provide privacy. Birds love to forage for seeds and insects in the sunny but layered hedgerow. The hedgerow is simply a mixture of trees, shrubs, flowers, and grasses. Notice also the fairly tall turf grass. The taller the grass equates to longer roots and more drought tolerance. This is our boulevard garden. Fortunately, we don't live on an intersection. I still cut down the taller plants in June before they bud to try to reduce their height so they bloom shorter. I did take a screenshot of just the St. Paul ordinances. The city codes, were, they especially don't want you to put tall plants in your boulevard. So if you're not at an intersection, they can be as tall as 36 inches. If you're near an intersection, you need to be no taller than 18 inches for your plants. So I just, Wanted to let you know a little bit about, um, I've talked about rain gardens here. Not everybody knows what a rain garden is. They're a very effective way to capture every bit of rain in a drought or provide storage and time for excess stor storm water to soak into the ground. So they're good, they're good in a drought. They're, they do better though, soaking up excess storm water. This little rain garden is planted with shade and water tolerant high bush cranberry and dogwood shrubs, along with Canada anemone and golden Alexander flowers. It provides privacy, beauty, 
nectar and berries and all these benefits and it collects and filters water from our garage roof. The backyard rain garden is planted with flowers. The Michigan lily is the, in the middle, took five years to bloom. It was possibly hindered by the fact that apparently they are just delicious. But it was worth the wait. Since a rain garden involves digging a shallow depression, you must call 811 before you dig. If you still don't know where to put your native plant garden, one of the most critical areas you can convert is underneath a native tree or tall shrub. For humans, trees are valuable because they provide shade, capture and absorb rainwater, store carbon, and provide beauty. For birds looking to feed their chicks, native trees and shrubs are an all-you-can-eat buffet. Hundreds of species of caterpillars that are essential food for chicks spend part of their life in the trees or shrubs. Many, for many insect species, the next stage of their life cycle is spent either in leaf litter or underground. Traditionally maintained lawn treated with chemicals and frequently mowed does not provide a safe haven for insects. To highlight their habitat value, we're starting to call these understory gardens soft landings. Where practical, have a native planting under the full drip line of trees. This is especially important under keystone species of trees and shrubs such as oak, blackberry, American basswood, native maple, birch, American plum, choke cherry, which support hundreds of different species of caterpillars, making them keystone species. Noted conservationist Douglas Talmy describes keystone species as the backbone of local ecosystems in terms of producing feed that feed, food that feed insects. These keystone species are listed by zip codes on the National Wildlife Federation's native plant finder. I use the Minneapolis zip code to select a few keystone plant species for the metro. I list the plant name as well as the number of caterpillar species each plant supports. So a river birch, most people don't realize caterpillars, Lepidoptera, refer to both butterflies and moths. So that's 329 different butterfly or moth species that rely on a river birch tree. Now, river birches aren't exactly rare in, in the metro, but hickories maybe are a little more rare. So, and by willow, we don't mean the weeping willow that come from Asia, we mean that, mean our our willows here. There's um, many different types of willows. Surprisingly, we just kind of grow up knowing weeping willow, but if you're a paddler, you've seen a lot of different willows on sandbars, for instance. These are some of the shade tolerant keystone species that you can have in your soft landings garden. And I'll talk more about this in the spring. But for now, I wanted to give you a site preparation overview. Hopefully you have some idea of where you might, if you don't already have a native plant garden, where you might wanna put one. For most types of gardens, you do not have to remove the turf grass. You can compost in place using a technique called sheet mulching. Do not use plastic, especially black plastic, as that would destroy the beneficial soil microorganisms. Brown paper on rolls from the paint department is better for the environment. The timing of this presentation is no accident because fall is the perfect time to prepare your planting bed for spring planting. The disadvantage of starting in the spring is that you should wait until the soil has a chance to dry out a little. Um, and we know that can often take until mid-May really, because since we sometimes have an April snowstorm.
So this is just uh, all the reasons you should mulch with something. And we'll talk about that a little more. The paper and mulch will break down over the course of a couple years. This enriches the soil and makes a good seed bed for even more native plants. So especially with climate change, um, insulating the soil from temperature extremes, very important. I think one of the most attractive options is to take a cue from nature and the woods around you and use sticks, branches, and leaves. Most garden sites recommend shredding leaf mulch, but in the woods, spring wildflowers have no problem coming up through the leaves. You will want the water to water the leaves so they stay in place or lay down branches to help them stay in the first until the first snowfall helps mat them down. So many people think this is how a garden should look because we're used to seeing traditional gardens, but the same garden provides far more ecosystem services when it's mature, like this one. Years later, we've never replenished the mulch. There's plenty of leaf debris to keep the soil moist. The Twin Cities chapter of Wild Ones has a number of resources on their homepage, including this one that has plants that are especially good at becoming a living green layer. The ultimate goal is to have a carpet of living mulch in your garden. You never need to reapply wood chips, which saves money and time. Although we had materials on hand to create hard edges, if I had to do it again, I would stick with a shoveled edge, also known as a Victorian trench. This allows you to easily grow your garden bed without having to relocate heavy cement blocks. And you always want to avoid microplastic in the environment when you can. So never put down a plastic weed barrier or plastic edging. And this um, allows wildlife and water free flow into and out of your garden is, is really important. If you've ever, we used to have um, goslings that would come to our seed our bird feeders underneath our bird feeders and you know the mom would hop up and over the cement block and keep going and not realizing she was she was missing our little goslings because they couldn't make the the leap over so you won't find it in red on the um wild ones twin cities um home page but i put it in red so you could see all the wonderful resources that they have on their homepage that has just some excellent information. So barring unforeseen circumstances, part two of this presentation will be April 4th, 2023. We will cover where to find native plants, selecting the right plants for your site conditions, and again, keystone species that are most beneficial. But I just want to um, talk a little more about some of the things to avoid. People don't realize how harmful, you know, fertilizer, how can that not be good for your soil? Chemical fertilizers, it turns out they have um, salts. And, you know, during Roman times, if, if you wanted to, to just destroy the land, you, you salted it. And it's, we're, we're doing this to ourselves with, we use enough road salt um, in the winter to de-ice our roads. We don't need to be adding it in fertilizers too. Um, tilling and digging, I um, until recently had a vegetable garden and I started with the no-till method, which meant that I just cut the plants off at the ground and then put a layer of compost, a layer of newspaper, and then lots of these on top. And I never till then. Um, yeah, that is that is like 12 inch, I built up like 12 inches of um, soil in that garden bed over the course of maybe what a decade. Yeah. 
So mowing under your native trees, it, it kind of drives me crazy when people have these tiny little, maybe they got mulch or rock, or maybe they have hostas, but it's, it's tiny. And the canopy of the tree might extend for 20 feet, but they, they've got a little, you know, three foot garden underneath and that's just not, not enough. So we really want to go to the drip line. So try not to mow under your trees. It's better for the roots, but much better for the tree and the, and the microorganisms and the caterpillars. So in light pollution is another thing. A lot of us probably grew up seeing, you know, hundreds of fireflies in our backyard and they're, they're just gone. Light, light pollution has, you know, killed a lot of moss, just killed a lot of insects in general. I know it's a safety issue sometimes, but um, maybe motion sensor lights or just be aware that, you know, try to minimize your use when, where it's, when safe to do so. So this is just a quick thing where you retain turf grass. We, we don't have much left, but we have our grass paths and we keep them at their highest, um, we mow it at the highest setting. And we didn't water it all this year. And especially if it's gotten a little um, shade, it is still green and lush, which I think is really offensive to my neighbor who mows every week and fertilizes and stresses the heck out of his poor turf grass. And it just looks brown and pretty sad. Um, so leave the leaves. I, Hope that you've all heard that slogan now. Um, your your leaves are just really gold, especially in these times when there might be jumping worm invasives, jumping worms, eggs, tiny microscopic thing, and any plant material or or mulch or manure or you know composted that you buy from a native plant nursery, you just can't be too careful anymore about invasive species. So the key is your your leaves are very valuable and don't don't waste them, use them in your environment. And don't don't buy more mulch, buy more native plants. So these are a few resources, and that is the end of my presentation. If anybody has any questions, speak now. <laughs> uh, I just want to mention there, if you're looking for hickory trees around Lake Nokomis, there's quite a few. And if you're bicycling through there, you may be kind of running over a few. But uh, yeah, they're very hard. <laughs> but anyway, I was just wondering, um, is there a way to make some, like a garden out of this where you could, you know, maybe have edibles, you know, through the summer or uh, would that work into this at all? Or Yeah, if you go back to that, um, it's wildonestwincities.org. One of the resources that they do have is edible landscapes. For instance, service berry bushes are native and it has a blueberry type um fruit on it and if you can beat the birds to them you you can eat them and um one of the other let's see what am i missing here we grow hazelnut bush so but i don't think we've ever once beaten the squirrels to those um right we we've had raspberries volunteer in our yard and since it's all garden bed now they they grow up and so we used to get a handful and now we have to go out with bowls um, to pick them. They actually make it make it inside. They used to only make it into our mouth and tummy. Um, so yeah, there are a lot of edible, wonderful edible plants. Some needs to be cooked, I guess. There are native plum trees. Say Marilyn, uh, Don Bushek has a question. Okay. Actually, I have two questions. One is, <clears throat> first one is, how do, how do you contain uh, aggressive native plants that you've established in your yard from creeping into your neighbor's property if, you know, if that's what you want to do? And second is, um, um, where, where do you obtain 
these massive amounts of of newspapers, for example, <laughs> to, to, to sheet mulch your, your, your good size area. Um, and that, I, that's always been a, a puzzle to me where, where people are getting these uh, uh, materials. Yeah, I actually did go um, door to door when we were first doing this. But then we discovered this, um, it's kind of like brown craft paper on maybe three foot wide rolls and you just roll it out. We've discovered that one layer doesn't quite do it, especially if you have something with weeds with a good tap root, like dandelions have a good tap root, and they'll just come right through one layer. So we do two layers. Um, so that works great and is very in inexpensive. Um, having them volunteer in your neighbor's yard, I. I consider it a, a real success story. My neighbor has a um, just a mass of um, lily of the valley, which is kind of an aggressive non-native. I, I wouldn't call it invasive, but it's very aggressive. They, um, and there's actually a couple of um, zigzag goldenrod growing in it now, which I, you know, all, all hail to that brave little zigzag goldenrod. Yeah, she hasn't complained yet. And the neighbor on my other side, he mows everything. There, there's not a garden bed um, to actually get volunteers in. So, but I'm I'm talking about um, um, in, um, moving into their their turf, into their lawn. Well, he he mows it so it really can't get very established. He mows okay, it, so, he does the whole weed and feed and. Okay, so in other words, just don't worry about it. If they have, if they have an established lawn and they probably would care, then they're gonna mow it and take care of the problem itself. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Is there like okay, a reasonable amount of space you could do maybe or something or, you know, like, you know, leave a six foot boundary or something. <laughs> Yeah, that's um, probably a good idea if you think you have a neighbor who's really going to be uh, really going to mind that. It, it might even be part of the city ordinances. I know we only left a couple of feet on each side and um, fortunately nobody's complained, but we probably should have left a little more. <laughs> Say, Marilyn, we have a, a I question in the chat, and then I see that Terry also has her hand up. The question is, can you use cardboard for sheet mulching? Yes, just to remove all that sort of plastic tape-like stuff and use the cardboard. If it started as a box, of course, you've got a lot of these seams and you have to overlap. Otherwise, you're going to have plants coming coming up in the, in the cracks, so to speak. Um, Sure, and I can um, share my slides if um, somebody can help me figure out how to do that, I'd be happy to. So I have a comment. Um, I think a lot of people have gotten the message that we need to uh, create gardens to help bees. Uh, the issue I have is that a lot of people don't distinguish between bees and wasps, and when you're at a at a reunion or something, and there's something that might sting you, the chances are it's a wasp because bees are not very aggressive. And uh, even though wasps are beneficial, it would be nice if people could distinguish between bees and wasps. And there's a, no a lot of native bees in Minnesota, which are very beneficial. And most of them are very non-aggressive. I'm actually allergic to yellow jackets, but I walk, uh, through my native uh, native plants, and there's a lot of native bees there, and they're like I say, they're very non-aggressive. So it'd be really good if people could distinguish between bees and wasps, and when something uh, stings them or is aggressive or is is a pest, not um, immediately call it a bee when it's the chances are it's probably a wasp or a honeybee, which is not native to this country, and they live in hives. It's really the hive dwelling bees and wasps that are the most aggressive. If they live singly and underground, they yeah, you can you can walk through a bunch of them on a plant and they will not bother you. They're just busy collecting nectar and pollen. 
providing for the next generation. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad to hear you say that, Barry, because I, I remember the Facebook pictures of when you were mowing the lawn and you kept getting stung. Yeah, you're, you're highly allergic. So it's nice to know you don't, you don't blame the bees and that it, yeah, it's wasp and wasp are very good predatory insects that are, are wonderful for the environment, um, especially for agricultural, for insects that, you know, damage agricultural crops. But a lot of people can't appreciate the, you know, the, the wonderfulness of, of bees and wasps. <laughs> Hey, uh, Marilyn, we have two more hands up. Um, okay. Terry, Terry has a question. Um, I have a question about maintenance. Once you plant these gardens, is it, a, is it the same amount of maintenance as a flower garden, for example, or is it less maintenance? Um, you know, this, this is a tough question for me because I enjoy spending time in my garden so much that to me, it's not even work. And I know I am pulling like in the spring, I'm pulling little maple seedlings. I think my neighbor has an invasive Norway maple that seeds like mad um, in my nice garden beds. Um, so I'm pulling those up and I just learned that Canada goldenrod is alleliopathic, which means it exudes um, chemicals into the soil that make the soil beneficial to other goldenrods, <laughs> candida goldenrods, but not for other plants. So basically it doesn't play well with others like garlic mustard does the same thing. So, um, you know, I'm just editing here and there and I just think of it as a pleasure. I know some people um, leave it go way too long. And then I imagine it is work. I helped out at the old Cedar Avenue bridge, the wildlife refuge um, weeding last weekend, the weekend before. Anyway, um, it was it was a mess. They they thought the city was going to take care of it, and the city thought they were taking care of it. And there's like more weeds than native plants, and it was a real mess. So if you keep on top of it, I just guarantee as you walk through your yard, you'll you'll really enjoy that. Does anybody else with a native planting have anything to share on that? I I just my husband and I just consider being out in that landscape now so much fun, whereas mowing the lawn is, is a chore, whereas going out and, you know, <laughs> seeing what's in bloom is, is just a pleasure. So it's hard for me to judge. I would just like to make a plug for iNaturalist because I use iNaturalist a lot in my backyard so I can figure out what is a invasive species that maybe I don't want and what is a uh, something that's volunteered in my yard that is a native, and that makes it a lot easier to know what what to pull and and, and what to keep. So, and you can also ID mushrooms on those if you're into mushrooms too. So, iNaturalist is a really nice app. And is it called Picture This, Tom? Yeah. Picture This is another one does plants, animals, etc. But it, you get an immediate response. Now we discovered at least in one case that it was an immediate response that was absolutely incorrect, but um, it was quick. <laughs> Whereas um, my naturalist, I think is kind of curated and experts weigh in and yeah. but it takes time to get a, an answer. Yeah. Yeah. I naturalist will give you an immediate answer and then it does get checked by others. Okay. And I found it to be way more accurate than picture this or snap yes. leak for some of the others. Okay. All right. Um, we have a question from Kim and then Fran. Okay, Kim. Hi, thanks for the presentation, uh, Marilyn. I've, I've always let my yard go and uh, I like cutting it just like once a month or maybe once every other month. But I have a low uh, growing creeping Charlie and um, it does spread over to the neighbor's yard and I'm concerned about it because it's a hardy plant. And 
So I don't know if I should just deal with it or if the natural evolution will will crowd it out and what happens in, in that regard? So um, Creeping Charlie is, is tricky. I'm not sure if you're all familiar with the Lawns to Legume program. They will help pay for the lawns to leg room, but they'll also pay for a native planting as well. And I highly encourage you to go with the native planting and not the, the lawns to leg room, which actually they're promoting some invasive species like Dutch white clover. And originally they were gonna recommend Creeping Charlie, but they mm -hmm. found out that um, it had a very unreliable amount of nectar. It might, might be, um, you know, 5% in one flower and 80% sugar in another. And it just was kind of a waste of a bee's time if it was looking for a certain percentage. So um, Creeping Charlie, I, I don't know what to tell you. I thought I was gonna have a problem with that. And then as the native plants got established, I just don't. Um, it's pretty amazing. We we are editing mostly maybe a few dandelions and mostly native plant experts say again, they're gonna be shaded out by the taller native plants. Don't even worry about them. So um yeah, I really we really have we have volunteer, you know, trees where we don't want trees, things like that, but Creeping Charlie hasn't been a problem, so I don't really have any advice for you um, on that. Sorry. <clears throat> um, I've lived in my house for many years, like 28 years. And when, when I moved in, there were some mature trees on the lot, which are still, which are huge now. Um, one is a black walnut tree. And it's lovely and provides great shade, although it's kind of messy. Um, but it also is, you know, toxic to a lot of um, to a lot of plants. There's a lot of stuff you can't grow with it, and they tell you to um, to also remove the the uh, the leaves to not leave them. Uh, that you can compost them, you know, but if you just leave them, that that they're also toxic. So what do you suggest for giving a tree like that? And you want to keep it. But um, I mean, grass already grows pretty badly underneath it. So I might as well do something different. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't have anything specific offhand that will grow under black walnuts. I have heard about them. Um, being problematic. Have you ever tried doing a Google search to see what what will grow in nature? Something must grow under black walnut. Some some things do. I'm not sure that they're that they're native, and so maybe I'll go back and look at it differently. I mean, hostas will grow under anything. Daylilies will grow. Uh, uh, um, what else? Um, bleeding hearts will grow. But I'm not sure that those are native. I have a few black walnuts in my backyard, and I have a lot of bee balm growing under my black walnut, and it doesn't seem to have a problem at all. And a lot of people tell me nothing grows under black walnuts, which is obviously not true. Some right. do, and it seems like some things have a problem. But I have a lot of bee balm under mine, and it seems to be growing just fine. So I would suggest bee balm, which is great for bees, hummingbirds, and uh, a lot of things. And okay, even thanks. tea. Yeah. Okay, thanks. I have an area that um, has been just had a whole lot of buckthorn taken out of it, but it's on a slope, um, a fairly deep slope that eventually goes down to kind of a pond, a drainage pond. And I don't know, I mean, all of the pictures and things that I see for prairie and for gardens and, and things really don't include slopes without 
you know, making terraces, which looks would seem to be a lot of work. So one, can you make prairie in areas where you just took out a lot of um, buckthorn? And two, what do you do about slopes? So there is a, a resource on that Wild Ones Twin Cities page about replacement plants for buckthorn. There's also a resource of um, I included it in the slides for ground cover plants. What I have heard of people doing if the slope is steep enough um, is taking those buckthorn logs, not the part that contains berries obviously, and then putting them kind of um, perpendicular to the slope and maybe staking them with smaller buckthorn branches and just doing that every once in a while. So until your native plants get established and the mulch forms a nice mat that isn't going to go anywhere in a downpour, they do that. There are also um, coconut logs made out of all natural materials um, that will decay even quicker that you can almost even plant in right into those logs. So there are things you can do. I kind of um, have to know exactly how steep we're talking here. Are we talking, you know, greater than 30 degree slope or? Because you I might be able to plant plugs and be fine. Um, the biggest problem is that it's just like bare totally bare from, you know, water just kind of going down. I think it's um, really hard and bare. I'm not very good at how much a slope is, but yeah, I mean, you have to be really careful going, walking down it. So is the slope, do you know, it's, it's west facing, south facing, north or east facing? Uh, this one is, uh, there's west, it's mostly west facing that I'm looking okay, at. So it gets lots of sun. So especially if there's a water body there and there's active erosion, I would think that your watershed district would be, I know where I live in Riley Purgatory Bluff Creek Watershed District, um, they would pay up to, I um, can never remember whether it's 3000 or $5,000, 75% of the cost of putting it in up to one of those two <laughs> figures. Um, up to a certain amount of money and they because you know everybody's seen how muddy water can get when all this topsoil winds up in it um so i would look for help there um yeah if you um look at ground covers in particular i think that would be a good that right off the hand. People are surprised to know that your humble little um, strawberry, there's a woodland strawberry, and then there's a strawberry that likes the sun, and it's really good ground cover, spreads by rhizomes. It's apparently beloved by many caterpillars too, so it's a great host pants for butterflies and moss, and yeah, it would help stabilize that hillside. But I, I would think that the city or the watershed district could provide some help. Do you know what watershed district you live in? Um, the, the water body is actually a drainage pond, which is connected to other drainage ponds and is full of, you know, like, duckweed and it gets worse and worse as the summer goes on but it's all connected to lots of different drainage mm -hmm. there it's actually a drainage pond from a uh, part of the flood control system in Egan okay I bet Egan has a fabulous water stewardship program so look um see what your watershed district is look for um stewardship grants from the watershed district 
in our watershed district, they actually have a landscape designer who will come out and he'll design it for you, tell you what plans to put in. And it's it's a, just a free service because that's that's how important it is. That's what a difference it makes to um, to soil health and erosion control and all that storing water in a in a massive rain event, which kind of wishing for one right now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Hey, Marilyn, um, yes. Ruth, Ruth has a question for you in the chat here. Have you had much experience collecting your own native seeds in the fall and growing plants from those? And do you have any tips for doing that? Um, <laughs> we just had our board meeting last night. It seemed like we were evenly split as to the joy of um, winter sowing. There's is another resource on the Wild Ones Twin Cities about what they call winter sowing. And there's winter sowing where you use a milk jug or something like that and you keep it outdoors. So the seeds go through all the stratification they normally would, but then you also have control because it's in a it's in a milk jug and it's protected from being eaten as it sprouts. And um, there's also um, winter snow so snowing sewing. <laughs> it's hard to say. Um, so what you do is you wait till there's snow in the forecast and you scatter your seeds right on top of the snow in like January. And then um, normally that would get eaten by the birds, but if you do it at the start of a snowfall or right before one's projected, you, the snow will protect it. And by the time the freeze thaw, freeze thaw from the spring, um, the plant will have gone through all the freeze thaw cycle it needs to to germinate and it will hopefully work its way down into the soil with the spring rains and you're all set. That that's the kind I I kind of can pre prefer. It um, sounds like less work to me than collecting plastic milk jugs and things. But um, the the programmers for our chapter and uh, would like to do a winter seed sowing where you use the milk jug. And I believe that. Wild Ones Twin Cities always has a monthly present, one presentation in, during the winter about that as well. So it is something that can be, that can be done. I, I just, truthfully, I take them in the fall. And um, especially if it's like trying to grow over a sidewalk or something, I'll take that and I'll just put it where I want it. I just kind of toss it there and hope for the best. And then I have a happy surprise a year later when, hey, look, just where I wanted it to volunteer. I got a, a new cone flower here. <laughs> I have a question about, um, you mentioned resources for other communities. Do you know if St. Paul has, um, or what the resources are for planning for um, prairie gardens, you know, in the city? So I guess I'm a little confused about the question. You're, you're asking how you can get your city to plant more prairie gardens? Or? No, I'm sorry. It's a, for planning, not planting, but planning. For actually planning a garden so you don't have to like. Do the work yourself? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yes. Um, I'm glad you asked that question. So our national organization, wildones.org, has gotten um, smart. And what they have done is hired a bunch of landscapers across the country to do presentations on landscaping your yard. And um, Carmen Simonette from, I think she's from St. Paul, she did one for our area and it her presentation is excellent. It should be available on the wildones.org website. As my friend likes to say, God help you if you forget to put the dot org down. Who knows what <laughs> you're gonna come up with? <laughs> 
<laughs> so are there people that come out to your, you know, like, even if you hire them, like come out to your home and look at your yard and plan for your specific spots? So like they can look at the soil, they can look at what was planted there before, they can look at, you know, how shady it is, all that stuff. So this brochure, hopefully you still see it. Um, we are fortunate to have many, many wonderful nurseries that specializes in, that specialize in native plants. And we've got this brochure on, well, all the chapters use it now on um, the Prairie Edge website, the, the um, Twin Cities website can find this brochure and if you click on it, it'll give you all of the landscapers and also people who provide services like Ed Buckthorn. And we've got little symbols by them, D, I, and M, and that stands for design, installation, and maintenance. And most of the ones in center, they're all um, nurseries, they're all growers, and they in addition, do all these extra functions. So if you were to get a watershed grant, they will pay for, I got a grant from the city of Eden Prairie. I couldn't believe it. They paid for things like mulch and mulch delivery and edging and mm. you know, not just the plant materials themselves. So it all varies a little bit by watershed to watershed and your city might have one. And definitely the state has one, you know, 350. It's not a lot, but most native plants, you buy them small because they have such deep roots. You can't wait till they're a year old because goodness, the pot would need to be five feet deep. Um, so usually they're little tiny plugs, so you can get a six pack for 12, you know, 10, 12 dollars. Oh, yes. And so the, um, a watershed steward grant will pay for, you know, the design. They basically, you supply the bill, you pay up front and they will refund you, um, the design, the installation, and several watersheds now even pay for three years of maintenance. So it doesn't get much better than that. So hopefully that answered your Yeah, question. thank you, it gives me a start. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, so you can definitely hire a lot of these, they're busy because Native plants are finally catching on. The message is getting around. Are there, this has been a great discussion. Are there any other questions for Marilyn? And again, I'll, I'll see you back in April. I can answer the rest of your questions then. <laughs> well, thank you, Marilyn. <laughs>